All right, so I want to start off by talking about the chart. Uh, I wish this was a little more clear. This is the best we can do with the, uh, when you blow this up that big. Uh, we talked last week about the original New Testament autographs at the top uh, of the chart. The original ones written by a Peter and a Paul and a John and a Matthew, the guys that actually penned it in ink on a piece of papyrus. Those don't exist anymore, all right? Time uh, has destroyed them uh, because it's been 2,000 years and uh, paper doesn't last that long, especially when you make it out of reeds from the Nile River. Uh, it's not going to happen. We talked about how those copies of each of those books was made, and there were copies being made all over the Mediterranean world, in Alexandria, in Antioch, in Jerusalem, uh, in Rome, later in Byzantium. They were being made, copies and copies and copies and copies everywhere. And so we have a whole spider web of copies being made uh, of each of these New Testament books. Eventually, as we get into the 3rd, the 4th century, they start being collected together into the Gospels, and then all the Gospels are being copied together, or all the writings of Paul. And then eventually after that, they start you know, debating, well, what, what books are supposed to be part of the canon, which are not? And that's a process that the church took. So that was all copies. This is all in Greek. We are, Greek is the lingua franca, it's the language of the common people of the Mediterranean, uh, of the Roman Empire during this time period. So all of this copying is being done. Eventually, we start to see by 200 or 300 what we call text families, Byzantine, Alexandrian, and Western. That refers to the way in which the readings are in them. We talked about how there are variants in some of them, right? Mistakes that copyists made. When you look at the different uh, manuscripts, of which there are almost 6,000 by now, uh, you can see the text families, if you're one of those Greek experts. And so you've got ones that read the same from this area in Byzantium, some that read the same from this area down in Alexandria, and some that read, they call it Western, uh, in a Roman way. And so you start to develop text families. The three codex that we said that they found. Now, this long line here says, basically, if you could read it, you can read it on your chart. These are going to be out of commission and unknown until the 1800s. They're not going to be part of our story until next week. So even though they exist, even though I showed you pictures of them last week, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus uh, are going to be sort of on the sidelines during all this. But all of those were Alexandrian in their readings. Okay. So we talked about that. We're up here now to the 400s. We're going to start talking about Jerome. That's where we're going to begin. So we haven't gotten that far on our chart, but we're going to make it all the way down to the 1600s today. We also said that during this time period, copies, uh, not only copies, but translations were made of the New Testament uh, and the Bible as a whole into Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, a whole bunch of other languages. Uh, and they won't be part of the story again, once again, until the 1800s. You see that this line will come back and be incorporated into the text. And we'll worry about that later when we get to it. So, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We've got many, many, many copies of the New Testament uh, that go all the way back, some of which to the first century after they were written, uh, but they're very early, they're very well preserved, and once we uh, collate them and figure out what the errors are. Uh, the estimates range from 95 to 99 percent accuracy, depending on which person you're talking to and what they consider uh, in their statistics. Uh, so it's very good text in that respect. So let's pick it up from there. Let me switch from the chart to my regular PowerPoint. And we'll start with, come on up, oops, I'm going to fast forward it, as it were. That's all last week's, last week's, last week's, uh, yep, yep. Ah, Jerome, all right? So AD 380, you get a man named Jerome who decides that he wants to, that he needs to translate uh, the Greek of the New Testament, and he wrote the Old Testament into Latin, all right? In the West, Greek is not as common as it is in the East, and this is something that is indicative of the Roman Empire. 
there is always sort of an east-west split that kind of goes right about here. Everything Greece and, and Egypt over this way is in the east. North Africa, Italy, Spain, that's the west. Uh, it's actually, uh, the empire is going to be divided into uh, administratively along those lines, east-west. But they, all, they always had a different cultural feel to them. Uh, Greek is going to predominate in the east, but in the west, Latin is more useful. So they say, you know what, we really could use a Latin translation. Uh, and this is a picture of what it would look like. As you can see, you're starting to recognize the script, perhaps. The letters look familiar, but unless you had some Latin in school at some point, that's not going to do you any good. So Jerome comes up with a direct translation from the Greek and the Hebrew, which is the way we do it today. Directly from the original Greek and Hebrew, you make a translation of it. He looked at the Septuagint, the LXX, for his Old Testament, you know, just to, to check what he knew about the Hebrew and make sure he was getting good translations, but he used the Hebrew directly. This will be the primary text of the Western Church, all right? The church in the Western half of the empire. Uh, which eventually will become, you know, Spain, France, uh, Germany, England, all of that. It will be the primary text of that church until the Reformation. So this is a significant translation, all right? That's from 380 to the 1500, so, you know, 1200 years nearly. This is the Bible of the church, all right? Once again, this is a one-man effort. Jerome did this work all by himself, uh, and it's going to be a one-man effort all the way up until we get basically to the 1600s. It's all going to be people doing this one, you know, really smart guy at a time. So Jerome makes that translation. I want to show you this one just for uh, illustrative purposes. This is the earliest complete Latin Vulgate Bible. They called it the Vulgate uh, when, when Jerome made his translation because it was an insult. Vulgate, vulgar. They said he, he translated it like, you know, regular people spoke. You know, not like an aristocrat, not like an educated person, in the regular people's uh, language. And they didn't like that. You know, snobby people didn't. So they called it the Vulgate. That sounds maybe cool now, but then it was meant as an insult. This is the earliest one we have. It's called the uh, Codex uh, Amiatinus uh, from about 716 AD. Uh, and this is actual size. The Bible itself was seven inches thick. Okay? Weighed 75 pounds. So it's not a pocket edition. Uh, it's, it's not a carry it with you edition. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like those ones that you have, you know, in the church, you have one nice big one to, to set up front there, but much heavier. Um, uh, in the early 8th century, uh, monks in northern England, of all places, made uh, three Bibles like this. One for, there were two monasteries that worked together, they were like associated with each other. One for each of them, and one that they sent to Rome. Uh, let's see here. Da, da, da. Uh, Colfried, the monastery's abbot, set out to deliver the Pope's copy, but he died along the way. All right, it's a long way from northern England uh, to Rome. He didn't make it there, uh, and nobody knew if his copy got there or not. What happened to it? The guy didn't live, so they figured what happened to it. For a thousand years, nobody knew where it was, until it was found in southern Tuscany, of all places. Uh, and now they realized uh, exactly what it was. It took them a while to realize that this was the one that came from northern England that that monk had tried to deliver. Uh, but it's a 75-pound uh, Bible, all by hand. All right. These now are going to be on vellum, which is animal skin, uh, kind of like leather, only, uh, only better uh, for this kind of thing. So papyrus is going to give way eventually because the vellum, even though it's more expensive, it holds up longer. Uh, so that's just an example of Jerome's Vulgate. An interesting story about Jerome's translation is that when the Bible was, when Jerome's translation was used in North Africa, you know, North Africa over here, part of the empire in the west, uh, for one of the readings in church, people actually rioted. 
And the reason why will, will floor you because this is not something that you or I would ever think anybody would get upset about. In the story of Jonah, at the end of the story of Jonah, he sits down to watch and see if Nineveh is going to be destroyed, right? And the plant is there that gives him shade and the worm eats it. The, dis the, the word that Jerome picked uh, for what that plant was, he, called, he thought it was supposed to be translated from the Hebrew as a castor oil plant. In the Latin translation they had before this, it said a gourd, and the people flipped their lid. That he had changed it from a gourd to a castor oil plant. And they went nuts, and they literally rioted in the streets. Uh, St. Augustine, one of the, probably the second most influential person in the history of the church for his writings after the Apostle Paul, St. Augustine wrote Jerome a letter and said, I don't have a problem with your translation. It's a fine translation. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not what the people are used to. And that was enough for them to flip out and have a problem. All right? Now, if you know anything about translating uh, uh, plants or animals from one language to another, it is a very hard thing to do. You get this Hebrew word that's talking about some plant, and you're like, what exactly, which plant was that? And how do we put that, you know, because it's not like they had a system of taxonomy and whatnot back then. Uh, with all, all the scientific stuff. So it is one of those things. When Jerome's Bible was introduced, it had a rough go. People were not sure that they liked it. You know, it was different. Uh, it took a while to catch on. So keep that in mind as the story progresses, because we're going to see that ourselves in this same spot, fast forward in the future, people acting the same way about the same issue. All right, so there you've got Jerome's Latin. I think I don't want to go to the next All right. So for the next 1,200 years, it's all copies by hand. It's all in Latin. So you'd think there's not much, no new developments. What are you going to do differently, right? Everybody's just doing the same thing. They're just making copies of Jerome. So what did they do? What they started to do then was be artistic with it. And here is one example of one avenue that somebody took. This is basically a pictorial Bible. All right, it's a Gothic manuscript uh, from 1240. Uh, and the interesting thing is originally it had no text. This is the story of David uh, being depicted here, uh, David being chosen over his brothers. There's little David out there with his sheep. You got a lot of people that can't read, right? Pictorial Bibles are, are, are a uh, solution to that, in part. Uh, there, this has Latin captions, Persian inscriptions, uh, Judeo-Persian captions, and then Hebrew characters on it. So somebody successively, uh, Persian, uh, Latin, uh, a version of Persian that's Hebrew, and then Hebrew. So they put captions on to explain what it was. But that, that was one avenue, was to try pictures. Uh, and you see with the many stained glass windows in the medieval cathedrals that exactly that's what they're doing. They're telling a story. You can go to a church with those kind of windows and look from window to window to window and see basically the whole story. You got the virgin birth, you know, you got this, you got that, you got the crucifixion, you got the resurrection, they're all on there. Uh, and so that was a way of uh, teaching people that couldn't read the stories of the Bible. This is also life-size. This is the Winchester Bible, all right? This is an illuminated manuscript. So this is the direction that it's going in. The text is normal, but you've got fancy capital letters at the different paragraphs, and then you have, you know, stuff in the margin. So you'll have one person that's the copyist and one person uh, or several people that are the artists doing the art in the margins. Uh, these Bibles were exceedingly expensive, but then again, so was a regular Bible to be copied. So if you had the money to have a regular one copied, you probably had the money to make it look nice, too. All right? So they, and they, they cared about such things. They spent the time doing it. This actually is the first page of Genesis. Uh, if you knew your Latin, you could see uh, where it says in the beginning up there in the corner. Uh, that's a large Bible. All right? Seriously, uh, and very detailed <coughs> pictures. Two more, just to illustrate this. This one is really uh, something out there. This is famous. This is the Book of Kells. 
All right. Ireland's finest national artistic treasure. Uh, it's the four gospels in Latin uh, from about 800 AD. Uh, let's see, let's see. The di it says the dark variations are highly complex and so intricate they can be seen only with a magnifying glass. Look at all these uh, shapes and whatnot. The person went to town on it. This is a cover page. This is called the Cairo page. Uh, those are two letters in Greek, the first two letters of Christ. Uh, it's kind of like the unofficial symbol uh, of Christianity for much of the Middle Ages and whatnot. So that they went to town uh, on the illustrations. Uh, so you can come and look up at this later, but my goodness, somebody spent months just doing this cover page for the Gospel of Matthew for this particular book. Um, and one more, just to show you the, the direction this is going. Uh, this is the Lins de Farne Gospels. Uh, da, 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 da. The text is once again in the Latin, but uh, 200 years later, and this is something interesting, a priest named Aldred in inserted between the lines of Latin an Old English translation. Uh, you don't see it here on this cover page, but they put in between the lines Old English. Now that's not technically a translation into English because none of us could, re could recognize it. It's much like Beowulf, all right? Old English is, is, was old when Shakespeare wrote. Uh, so you're not going to recognize any of it. Um, this is the beginning of the genealogy of Christ, this page, uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. So, during the Middle Ages, they spent most of their, the innovation was, in, was artistic. Nobody was doing anything different. Nobody thought to do a translation. Because Latin was the language of learning. Science, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, they're all in Latin, which has some benefits, right? If you are a doctor or an astronomer or a philosopher in England or France or Spain, you can read what everybody else in your profession is doing. You don't have to learn another language. Everybody's using Latin for that. And there aren't that many people that can read anyway, so there really isn't a, a groundswell or, a, or a, a push for the Bible to be in the vernacular to be in the language of the people, because the only people that can read can read Latin. That makes sense, right? Uh, so it's not as if anybody was necessarily keeping it from them, it just, they just didn't see the need. All right? So that's what's going on in the West. Yeah. All right. Before I get to John Wycliffe, I got one more thing on the notes. This, the Great Schism of 1054. And if you don't know about the Great Schism of 1054, it's probably because we don't teach church history very well. In 1054, for the last time, the eastern and western halves of Christendom split. All right? In actuality, the patriarch in Constantinople excommunicated the Pope in Rome, and the Pope in Rome excommunicated the patriarch in Constantinople. So... They weren't on speaking terms. They weren't happy with each other. But the empire had been growing apart for centuries. So even though they had switched to Latin in the West, they were still copying things in Greek in the East. And they will continue copying in Greek in the East uh, up until the end of the uh, eastern half of the Roman Empire. So you have two halves of the empire, a Latin and a Greek, they've grown apart, they're not really on speaking terms anymore, and things like the Fourth Crusade didn't help when the Crusader army, instead of going to try to retake Jerusalem, actually captured Constantinople uh, and destroyed and looted and raped it, uh, people there. That's not the kind of thing that, that helps people get along. Uh, that was all part of the rivalry, rivalry between Venice and the, the commercial traders of Constantinople. They were commercial rivals. And so they kind of steered the Crusader army there, thinking that would help their market share, uh, which it did, but it destroyed, you know, the largest city in Christendom uh, as, as a thing, as a consequence, which is not good. So you got the East and the West growing apart in that respect. One other thing happens before we get to John Wycliffe that will have uh, impact on the manuscript tradition, and that is the rise of Islam. 
in the 700s and following, all of this area over here, North Africa, Egypt, uh, the, the modern Middle East, all falls under the sway of Islam. Well, you're going to have a dramatic drop-off in new Greek manuscripts then, are you not? Uh, it, it's, there wasn't, for the most part, a lot of persecution per se, because remember, we talked about how St. Catherine's Monastery has uh, Codex Sinaiticus, and they live 700 years under uh, Islam without being destroyed. So they had varying degrees of uh, cooperation and whatnot, but it's going to put a huge cramp on the ability not only to produce new manuscripts, but to have access to the old. If you're a scholar uh, in France that wants to see if there are manuscripts in Egypt, you you got to have some connections and some pull in order to go down there. They're not just going to let you, you know, wander around and look for stuff. Uh, so you have basically uh, Islam in the south, orthodoxy in the east, Roman Catholicism in the West, we're, we're growing into, into fragmenting uh, parts. And then we get to the story of, of Wycliffe. Uh, Wycliffe decides that he wants to translate the Bible into English. 1382. Remember how long it was since uh, Jerome did the Vulgate in 380. So this has been a while. 1382. This is the first Bible the first complete Bible in English that, that was ever made. 250 copies of this still exist, which tells you something about how many handmade copies they made. That 250 of them are still around. That's pretty, pretty incredible. Now, if you look at our text here, this is in English. Uh, and you can kind of see that this says, in the beginning, spelt with the Y's. The Y's are, are an issue here. In the beginning was ye word, and, oh my, it's, it's tough, right? Was God, it's, it, it's the start of John, but it's tough, because that's old English, right? It's been a while since anybody was using old English. And it's also, notice, done by hand. So anytime you're doing it by hand, the script is going to be a little more difficult, because you're, you know, dealing with somebody's handwriting. Uh, there's a reason why I don't copy Bibles by hand. My handwriting is horrible. Uh, and that's just the way it is sometimes. But Wycliffe is a translation of Jerome's Latin, which is why on our chart, he is straight down from Jerome. All right? He is a descendant, as it were, of Jerome's Latin. He did not translate from the Greek and the Hebrew. He translated from the Latin, but that was the Bible of the West. So it was a natural choice for what to translate from. Unfortunately for Wycliffe, the government of King Henry IV in 1401 passed an edict, uh, and you can see the word heretico in there. That's not a good thing. They basically said, any heretics will be burned alive in our kingdom. And that was aimed at the Lollards. The Lollards were a group that uh, the kings of England were not fans of because they were kind of revolutionary. They were kind of like the precursor of the Puritans or, or the Pilgrims. All right? This is way before that, but they're that, that same kind of non-compromising spirit and whatnot. Kings don't appreciate that sort of thing. In that uh, edict against, uh, against them, uh, Wycliffe was a little bit caught up in that because it was assumed that his translation was for the benefit of the Lollards, that he was kind of implicated as being part of that. In 1408, they passed the Constitutions. It's not a constitution, it was, it, that's just the name of the, the bill, that banned any new translation. You can't translate it into English, you can't translate it in any vernacular without express church supervision. Now, think about that through. On one hand, you can understand why the church would want to do that. You just don't want people waking up and deciding, I'll translate the Bible into a language if they don't have the skill and the training and the access to the right documents, because they can translate something pretty freaky, uh, something that's going to lead people in the wrong direction. On the other hand, it's also, once again, it's, a, it's the tendency for people with power to want to maintain control no matter what. They don't want to, they're not trusting other people with power when they have power. That's an age-old dilemma. 
That's what power does to you. So they said, no new translations. And basically, from 1382 to 1525, nobody's going to try to do one in, in England. It's illegal. Nobody's going to attempt it. Arlene. Oh, man. It's always the 90-year-olds with their cell phones <laughs> causing trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many times when I was teaching a teenager cell phone yeah, went I'll off. I'll call you back later. I'll call you back later. But my teenagers had it on vibrate and they held it under their desk and did this with it. Mm. And I'm just like, dude, stop texting. I can see you. I know what you're doing. I am not. That was fun. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that anymore. <laughs> Arlene? <laughs> Wycliffe was never martyred or anything. He died uh, before any of his activities got him into real trouble uh, on, so of natural causes. So Wycliffe is the beginning of this idea, but it's in Old English, and the government basically puts a stop to it. Uh, and you're not going to see any of that anymore. This is one of the New Testaments uh, by Wycliffe. Now, of course, uh, they're going to vary in size. They made pocket-sized ones, they made big ones, because they're all being done by hand. There's going to be no uniform size uh, when it's being done by hand. Um, and if you wanted to, you could, you could, you know, really look at that and try to figure out, you know, what part of it, where you're at and what it's saying. It's, it's tough, but it's definitely English. This is basically the same English as Chaucer, all right? You ever had to study Canterbury Tales? Uh, it's rough stuff, but it's, it's English. Uh, but it's, it's de definitely old English. So you got Wycliffe, and he gets the ball rolling, but they kind of put a stop to it for a long time. Then something else happens that changes everything, and that is the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks. Uh, throughout, from basically 700 to 1400, the Muslim armies of various, uh, eventually ended up being the Ottomans, but it was early, different uh, ethnic groups earlier. They're heading in this direction. This all used to be Byzantium, the eastern half of the empire, all of this. And they're taking it away and taking it away until basically Byzantium is just a little bit on this side and just a little bit on that side. It's basically just the city and a little bit of land around it. The, the, and the Turks by now have gone even past that. They're all the way up here in the Balkans. But they couldn't take Constantinople. The walls of Constantinople were the best fortifications of the ancient world by far. They were amazing. They could not be stormed. You see, this is a fairly good representation. You've got water on three sides. You've got a very short land wall, all right, which makes it... Uh, pretty difficult. Now the Crusader army had sacked Constantinople, but uh, they kind of was kind of also an inside job, so they had some help with that. So the Turks were there, and they had besieged it before and didn't, didn't manage to take it. Finally they do because of a new invention, a new invention in the West, gunpowder. Cannons really have a good time with high walls. They just knock them down. And so, revolutionizing uh, castle warfare. Basically, after this, every castle in Europe was obsolete and needed to be rebuilt because it could easily be destroyed by cannons. Not if you care about medieval uh, warfare. I, I do. I think that's it's fascinating. But Constantinople falls, the largest city in uh, Christendom, and a flood of Greek manuscripts go with it. Refugees, people getting out of town when they saw the handwriting on the wall. After the sack of the city, people leaving and you know they're taking these Greek manuscripts that they valued with them because they've been making copies for 1,500 years now in this spot. They got a lot of copies. All right, they take them with them and they flood into Western Europe. Now these are all Byzantine text type, which is because they were made in Byzantium. That's the the way that they read. So it's a fascinating new opportunity for scholars in the West. And they realize, you know what, we really ought to be studying Greek. 
<coughs> we ought to be reading the Bible in the original Greek. Let, let's get back into that. And so these intellectual people, these scholars, these people that study the Bible, they really start getting back into the idea of reading the Bible in its original language and not in Jerome's Latin because of the fall of Constantinople. It, really, it spurs that on uh, because these are suddenly available uh, in the West in great numbers. So there's one thing that's going to change uh, our, our story, and that is the interest, renewed interest in Greek. All right. The second thing, and more uh, momentous, probably one of the most momentous things in the last thousand years to happen uh, in the Western world, and that is the printing press. This is a Gutenberg Bible. Gutenberg Bibles today are worth mucho dinero. They are very expensive. Uh, there are a lot of museums and libraries and universities that have them. They're, they're quite nice. In 1455, the first book was printed. And it was, of course, the Latin Vulcate. What else to print? There's more demand for the Bible than any other book. So. Uh, Gutenberg knew what he was talking about. He's trying to make money and sell books, so he prints it. Four, only 47 of those original printing remain. Uh, but, so as you can see, scarcity uh, has something to do with value on a collector's market. Uh, Gutenberg Bibles are worth a lot. So how does this change things, the Gutenberg Bible? Up until this point, any document in the ancient world had to be copied by hand. No matter how important or how long, if you wanted another copy, you did it by hand. Slow, tedious, expensive. The Gutenberg uh, printing press is going to change everything. Gutenberg gets the, the credit because he was the first one successfully, kind of like Edison with a light bulb. Everybody was trying to figure out a light bulb. Lots of people were trying to do printing presses. He figured out a practical way to do it. By 1500, so this is 1455, 45 years later, Bibles from printing presses are in 17 European countries. 260 towns in 45 years have a printing press. From one to 260 towns with them, and, there, and some of those towns had multiple printers. 1120 printing offices total in those 260 towns in 45 years. All right, this is as revolutionary as the computer and the internet have been for modern society, uh, but probably more so. 10 million, I'm sorry, 40,000 different things had been printed in 45 years. That tells you there was a huge pent-up demand for printed materials. Now, the Bible, they're printing more of that than everything else, but also philosophical things and political things. Uh, texts of, of, of uh, medicine and all sorts of things. People want, there was so much stuff that they wanted that they couldn't get because it was expensive. The printing press changes all of that. All right? 40,000 things, different things were printed in those first 45 years of the printing press. 10 million copies. That's far more copies than had ever been copied of anything ever in just those first 50 years. It's going to transform everything, from education you know, to the sciences to, to everything. Because all of a sudden, people have access at an affordable price to printed materials. Okay? Most of our homes have multiple Bibles, don't they? Some of us have half a dozen different ones. How many Bibles would you have if it cost $40,000 to get a Bible? Probably none, right? I mean, because you've got to live, you've got to pay your mortgage and eat, right? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of savings. The price drops down, right? The first computers were that way as well, right? First computers were only pe people, you know, huge corporations could afford them. And then eventually they introduced ones that the average, average everyday person, and now people are using them for absolutely no productive purpose at all. Uh, they're playing uh, all sorts of games on their iPad and whatnot. Uh, this is actual size of a Gutenberg Bible. Uh, Time Magazine called it the called uh, Gutenberg the Man of the Millennium uh, because of this invention. 1,282 pages, 
bound in two co in two copy or two volumes. So it was a, still a significant um, uh, fifty pounds is what it, it, it uh, the vellum one. And then when they switched to printing it on paper, it was only thirty pounds. Uh, so they're still fairly significant. Uh, this is the beginning, the end of Joshua and the beginning of Judges. Uh, but obviously you're not going to be able to read it. It's still in Latin. Uh, but that was where the demand was because there were people all over Europe that spoke and read Latin that, that were educated. They all wanted a Bible. Uh, and so there was a huge amount of There are 48 of them still in existence. Only 21 of those are complete. Uh, so getting your hands on one and being actually able to see one at a museum or something would be a, a huge accomplishment if you ever get a chance. So now we are ripe for a revolution, as it were, in the Bible, all right? You have the ability to finally make a lot of copies of something. But if it's still going to stay in the Latin, eventually we're going to run out of people that, that, that have that ability. Yes? Did Gutenberg print on vellum? Initially. He did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they eventually switched, uh, you know, got the, the ability to make Paper invented because of the printing press? Probably not. Uh, was it chicken egg? I, I don't remember the, the history of, of paper per se. My wife gets after me because I read a book on the history of salt, and she thought that was uh, was way too nerdy. Uh, <laughs> but I have not read the book on the history of paper. Okay. Uh, I'll be looking for it because I I would be fascinated by it. Um, this week's assignment. That's right, the history of paper. Uh, I mean, the Egyptians were the first ones to come up with paper, but it was just reeds yeah. pressed together kind of like in a, in a checkerboard fashion. It wasn't uh, modern pulp paper like we do now, with, you know, that they, they take all the wood and pulp it down, and then you know, that's a whole process. It smells something horrible uh, if you're ever near a printing uh, paper mill. So, we're not quite ready. Uh, for the next step. We've got one big important thing that is necessary before that. And before I talk about Desiderius or Erasmus, let me talk about the guy whose work got done first, but he didn't get to the printer first. Erasmus did. So Erasmus is famous, and everybody knows him, and this poor guy who did a lot more work, no one's ever heard of. Because he, his was done, but it wasn't ready for the printer yet. And as you look at this, you might understand why. This is the Complutensian polyglot, which is a fancy, fancy word. Polyglot meaning many, right? There's a lot of different stuff on here. Uh, this is from 1502, Cardinal Francisco Jimenez Cisneros uh, in Spain. So what has he got here on this? This in, uh, let's see, this is multiple things. This is fascinating. In the middle. We've got Jerome's Latin, all right? Start with what everybody knows, right? Over here on the left, we have Greek with the Latin uh, interlinear with it. So you can see which Greek word he was uh, translating from which Latin word. Over here on the right, you've got uh, the Hebrew, so this is Old Testament, with uh, little numbers telling you which Latin word it corresponds with. All right, this, and this was all done in a movable type where you had to set each letter one at a time. And you have Hebrew letters, Latin letters, Greek letters. The, the printer was, was a master. Uh, the guy that put it together was, was crazy too. Uh, but also notice Hebrew is written from right to left. So you can't do an interlinear with Hebrew. You can't put the Latin under because it's going the wrong direction. So they had to come up with the little numbers. Seven, eight, now, so you can see which one uh, it actually is. Uh, it sounds complicated, but it, apparently it's uh, not so hard once you get the hang of it. <laughs> uh, this was a fascinating work of scholarship because it uh, allowed uh, people who knew multiple languages to check. You know, what does the Latin say? What does the Greek say? The, the Greek would be in the Old Testament, the Septuagint, right? That old Greek translation. What does the Hebrew say? So if I knew Hebrew and Greek and Latin, I could have three different pictures into what the Old Testament text here says. So that's a very interesting uh, thing. At the bottom, he also has a couple of, uh, let's see, the, uh, at the bottom, the Turgamum. Uh, that is uh, 
an Aramaic version with Hebrew characters, and also a literal Latin translation. So he's got five different things going on each page, which means this took a lot of work to put together. Um, this is not something meant for mass production. <laughs> this is for scholars, people that know Hebrew and Latin and Greek, which is not as many people as all that. Uh, but he put a lot of work into that. While he was doing that, one of the printers uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, realized that that was going to be coming out soon. And so he said to Desiderius Erasmus, you got to get yours out before that guy's comes out. Because everyone's going to be like, wow, look at all the different things that he did. Uh, so they said to Erasmus, get going. All right, get this sucker ready. So basically, Desiderius Erasmus grabbed whatever manuscripts he could find of the Greek New Testament. And unfortunately for him, they're hard to come by. You've got to actually you know, go to different libraries and find them and whatnot. And back then, that's quite an effort. He had, and it varies uh, on the, if you look at different sources uh, to try to figure out how many he had, somewhere between 6 and 12. But the lowest number I've heard is 6, the highest I've heard is 12. Uh, manuscripts that he was looking at. So he's looking at maybe one from the 13th century and one from the 9th century. Maybe he's got one that's, that's you know, he's, but they're all Byzantine. All of his manuscripts are from the copies that flooded west when the fall of Constantinople. So they're older, they're not, I mean older, they're newer uh, by being older further from the writing of the New Testament. That's sometimes confusing. They're more recent, there, that'll help. They're all Byzantine, and he's only got a few of them. So we've got this giant spider web of copies, and he's only basically pulling on a couple of strands for his translation work, or for his collation. I'm sorry, he's not doing a translation. He's basically looking at those half dozen or eight or whatever they were, and putting one Greek text together out of that. All right. Now, there's nothing wrong with what he's doing. He just doesn't have as much, many resources as he would have liked. And I'll explain how we know that here uh, later. So it was a limited number of manuscripts. In a few places, he actually had to go to the Vulgate to try to figure out what it was, most notably in Revelation. Uh, Revelation, as I told you before, we have the least amount of text for Revelation. None of his six or seven or eight manuscripts had a complete Revelation uh, copy of it. So in a couple of places in Revelation, he had to say, what did Jerome write? All right, and he back translated that into Greek, uh, which is not the right way to do it, but it was all he had. His work is going to be hugely influential, and this is the text of it. You've got Greek on the left, you've got Jerome's Vulgate on the right. Erasmus said, I am not messing with Jerome. By now, everybody loves the Vulgate. It's been 1,200 years. Nobody would dare say anything bad about the Vulgate, right? It's beloved. They rioted 1,200 years ago. Today, they would riot it if you took it away. That's what happens. So he put them side by side so everybody could look and say, see, see, Any, anybody that had a, an issue that knew Greek and Latin could make sure he wasn't up to any funny business. <laughs> uh, so he put them side by side like that. This will be the basis of Luther's work when he translates the, Ger the German Bible. He's going to do it from Erasmus's Greek. Tyndale, when he does the English, is going to do it from Erasmus. The King, King James Version is going to be based on Erasmus. So much of our story, until we get to the 1800s, actually until we get to Westcott and Hort in the 1800s, is all going to be based on the work of Erasmus. Other guys like Robert uh, Stephanus, are going to publish further editions of that. They're going to take Erasmus's work, say, hey, we found a few more manuscripts, you know, let's make a couple of corrections and whatnot. But they're basically doing, working on the exact same uh, work as Erasmus. Uh, so this is big, all right? Because now we're back to the original Greek. If we're going to have a translation of the New Testament into French, German, English, whatever, we're going to need to start with the Greek. We don't want to take it straight from the Latin because then we're translating a translation. And the more steps you have in the process, the further you're likely to be from what the original authors wanted you to believe, to hear. All right. 
uh, he did not have access, as you know, to Sinaiticus. It's down here in St. Catherine's Monastery. He doesn't know it's there. He doesn't have access to it. He also did not have access to Vaticanus. He asked in one crucial thing, and we'll get to that next week when we talk about 1 John 5, 7 to 9. He asked his buddy that worked in the Vatican to look at Vaticanus on one that one crucial text. He said, I'm not, people are saying my reading here is wrong because he went against Jerome in that one spot. And people said, hmm, you can't go against Jerome. What are you doing? And so he said, back me up, buddy. Is it in there? Look it up, and, and, and you've got an old one there. Look it up and see if I'm right or wrong. And we'll talk about that more next week when we talk about that particular verse. Uh, so Erasmus does his work, and I have uh, actual size of Erasmus. It's actually the exact same page. What do you know? Uh, the one I found on the internet and the one I had from the book, it's the same thing. Actual size, Greek on one side, Latin on the other. Okay? Well, basically he's collating the available manuscripts and coming up with a Greek New Testament, which nobody has seen in the West in 1,200 years. Joe? Yes, Are they just purely scholars or with a holy, holy uh, man? Both. And that is actually pretty much the case uh, in every instance. Uh, Erasmus was a priest, uh, but he was also what we call a humanist. He was, he was a guy that believed in learning and studying and all sorts of things. Um, most of the guys that we're going to be talking that you're talking about in the Middle Ages for art, science, any of that, are, go are probably either monks, priests, or some such thing, because that's where the education and the learning is. Uh, the only schools that really existed, the universities, were all being run by the church in this era. There aren't any secular schools because uh, they just didn't exist. So well, the, the learning is the churches to give. Uh, and so he's obviously uh, connected to it. Now, I have heard people say, uh, unfortunately, when, when they were arguing about King James and different stuff, Erasmus was a Catholic priest, at like it's some sort of insult? Well, of course he was. What else could he have been if he was going to be a priest? This is before the Reformation. There isn't anything else to be. All right, unless he wants to move uh, to Eastern Europe and become an Orthodox priest, those are the only two choices, because that's the only church that exists. So it, it's, it, it says nothing about him to say that he was a Catholic priest. At this point in history, Catholic just means church. There, there is no distinction, because that's the only church that exists. Uh, unless you're in the East, uh, but there's a lot of separation and division between the sites. There's not a lot of back and forth going on. So now you've got Erasmus. On our chart, we had Erasmus in 1522, uh, 1516s when he gets started. Uh, Stephanus in 1550, uh, and they're basically doing that work of collating these available manuscripts. The number that are available are still, though, very limited. Okay, they will not become profuse at like they are now until the 1800s, uh, until modern scholarship finds them. So what is the next step? The next step is an intermediary step. We're not in English yet. Uh, the next step is for me to explain the Textus Receptus. You may hear this word thrown out, the Textus Receptus, and you think, what on earth is Textus Receptus? That is just Latin for the received text. That's literally what it means. Um, you can see receptus, receive, textus, text. It's the name given after the fact to the printed Greek texts of the New Testament, which constituted the translation base for the original German Luther Bible. So, like I said, Luther uses Erasmus. So, when he printed it, those six or seven or eight or ten that he uh, collated, he printed that, that becomes the textus receptus. It's not an actual manuscript, right? Because he's taking the different readings from the different ones and deciding what to put in there. So there is no Textus Receptus manuscript. It doesn't exist. It's only a printed uh, collation. You get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Because up until this point, these were all handmade manuscripts. So he's taking them and turning them into one printed version, smoothing out the errors and the mistakes that were in it. It is also the basis of the... William Tyndale's Bible, which we'll talk about next, the King James Version, and most other Reformation-era New Testament translation 
throughout uh, translations throughout Western and Central Europe. All right, it originated with uh, the work of Desiderius Erasmus in 1516, uh, the Dutch Catholic scholar, which just means his ethnicity and that he was a priest, and humanist Desiderius Erasmus. Detractors criticize it for being based on only some six, and this one said six, manuscripts containing between them not quite the whole of the New Testament. And I told you that. The missing ones were back translated from the Vulgate. Uh, and the sun is hurting us there. Although based mainly on late manuscripts of the Byzantine text type, so they're from here, and they're 12th, 13th, 15th century, they're not 2nd century, 3rd century, they're not that old. Erasmus's edition differed markedly, markedly from the classic form of that text and included some missing parts from the Vulgate. What we're going to discover later on is that the half a dozen ones that Erasmus had available to him are not a great representation of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ones we have that originate out of this area. If he had had more available, he would have come up with a, a text that better illustrated that tradition. Uh, so you will have people, and if you see them on the internet, if you go on YouTube, uh, if you type in Textus Receptus on YouTube, who will tell you that the Textus Receptus is basically like it came out down from heaven, you know, and it's the amazing thing. I just told you the history of it, all right? It's a half a dozen manuscripts. They're late. They're only Byzantine. And knowing that huge tradition that we have, that amazing tradition of the Bible, of all of these copies from all of these places, we really shouldn't limit ourselves so much. And we'll get back to that later. Uh, it was good for what it was at the time, but now we can do better. And I'll explain uh, when we get to the King James Bible about that. Martin Luther, all right, a sidestep. The Protestant Reformation happens in the meantime, and that changes quite a few things. Uh, Martin Luther, while he is in hiding, uh, because the Holy Roman Emperor had said, Basically, I am not condemning Luther to death, but if somebody happened to see him and killed him, I wouldn't be upset about it. That's, that's an emperor's way of saying, you, nobody's going to charge you with a crime if you kill him. You know? Kind of like uh, when, when the king of England said, who will rid me of this troublesome priest? And they, and they went out and killed Thomas Becket. Uh, it's that kind of thing. Uh, so he was in hiding. And he was being protected by northern German princes uh, who did not like the Holy Roman Emperor. Emperor, Much of the Protestant Reformation is quickly uh, caught up in the political fight within Germany over ruling. Germany is like all sorts of little principalities and dukedoms and fiefdoms. It is a mess. Uh, and the allegiances are, are, are an issue. They didn't really like being told what to do by the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and so they said, this Luther guy, whether or not we like what he has to say about the church and all that, let's, let's protect him and support him because it'll be sticking it to that guy. Uh, so it very quickly gets caught up in those politics, uh, unfortunately. We all know about Martin Luther. We're almost up on the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. We'll be there in a couple of years. Martin Luther... Uh, was reading Desiderius' Erasmus' Greek New Testament. And something he discovered uh, bothered him. He was having some issues. Um, and I, I'm going to quote to you from what R.C. Sproul said about this, because R.C. Sproul is a smart guy. Uh, it's from Romans 117. And if you know Romans 117, it says this, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He really struggled with that first phrase. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. What does that mean for the righteousness of God to be revealed? When he read Jerome's Latin, as everybody did, uh, it, the word that Jerome used there was a perfectly acceptable word, but it's the word uh, that we get justice out of it, out from. Uh, uh, Wiskasia, it's, it's justice. It, it's, it's a legal term. And so if you're reading the Latin, you, you're thinking that, that, that God's justice is being revealed in the gospel. 
But when he went to the Greek, it was a different word. And he said, well, obviously it's a different language, but he said, wait a minute, this, this doesn't square. I'm not sure what's going on. So let me read you what, what R.C. Uh, Sproul has to say about this, and, and you'll understand what I'm talking about here. Um, he says, there was a linguistic trick going on here, and, this, and it was this, that the Latin word for justification that was used at this time by the church, uh, and it's the word that we get in our English word justification from, just to care, that uh, came from the Roman judicial system. It's a term made up of the word justice, which is justice or righteousness, and the verb, uh, which means to make. Uh, so the Latin fathers understood the doctrine of justification is what happens when God, through the sacraments, through, through what, what the church does, makes unrighteous people righteous. Okay, and they were understanding it based on the Latin. It was an understanding of the text that they had. But Luther was looking now at the Greek word in the New Testament, not the Latin word. Uh, the word uh, dikaios, which didn't mean to make righteous, but rather to regard as righteous, or to count as righteous, or to declare righteous. The Greek word had a different nuance. And sometimes when you translate, especially technical words, from one language to another, you can mess up the nuance. It happens. Uh, purposefully or unpurposefully, and sometimes the new language just doesn't have the word that you want. Uh, and so it was an issue with it. It says, at, at, it was at this moment that, that Luther had his awakening. He said, and this is a quote of, of Luther, uh, no it's not, this is, I'm sorry, the, the, the quote comes later. Um, this is R.C. Sproul saying what he thinks uh, Luther was thinking. <laughs> uh, you mean here Paul is not talking about the righteousness by which God himself is righteous, but a righteousness that God gives freely by his grace to people who don't have righteousness of their own. Luther's quote is this, When I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost, and the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. Luther was a priest. He was a good guy. He was not a guy with a whole lot of sins in his closet, as it were. He was a guy that was living for God, and yet he never felt clean. He felt like he couldn't do enough to satisfy the justice of God. No matter what he did, he felt like he was, he was he, well, I'm going to cut it. And when he read the Greek New Testament that Erasmus had put together in Romans, his eyes were opened. And he said, wait a minute, the church has been misinterpreting it because they're reading it in Latin, and it's, it's putting a new shade on it that, the, that Paul didn't intend. And that began his process of awakening. The study of Romans, the study of Galatians in Greek opened uh, Luther's eyes and changed his, his thing. And then he puts the 95 pieces on the door, right? He wants to debate this issue with them, uh, and rather than debate, he got it. He got told to shut up and, and mind his own business, basically. And he said, "I can't." Uh, and the ball rolls from there. But it, the one of the things that was going on was that a simple issue of the fact that the Latin word there was—it's not wrong. It's just kind of—it it, it has a wider meaning, whereas the Greek has a narrower meaning, um, and that was what troubled uh, Martin Luther. Because the word justice makes you think about things like penance and purgatory and indulgences because you're trying to satisfy God's justice. Whereas righteousness led Paul, to, or Paul, Martin Luther to say this is a gift. And he ended up saying sola fide, faith alone because we can't earn it and all of that. So it becomes a big thing. While he's on the run, Martin Luther, or while he's on the run, while he's hiding, Martin Luther decides to translate the Bible for the common man in German. He says, you know what, let's go straight from the Greek to the German, so that the average folk can read the Bible for themselves and know what it says, they won't have to depend on anyone else. At the time, the German language is anything but standardized. You, people in southern Germany and northern Germany have a harder time understanding each other than you do if you go to Georgia. <laughs> All right, much harder. Uh, the, the language has is, is got some big differences in it. In 10 months' time, he translates the Bible into German, uh, the Greek, or excuse me, the New Testament anyway, based on Erasmus's work. But he didn't translate it in fancy German. He translated it in average, everyday German. And the way that, one of the ways that he did it was he went out into the marketplace, and he sat there and he listened to people buying and selling things. 
what, what words are you using for this? What words are you using for that? And he, he listened to the common people, and he used their German. It had a huge impact on the German language. If you were studying uh, the, the history of the German language, Martin Luther's work there is going to be monumental. All right? Now, that's not going to have much of an effect on our English Bibles, right? But it is going to have an effect on the political scene and on the church scene, obviously, going on in England. Uh, and so we'll see that coming. All right. Um, Getting near where, where I need to be, but I, I'm also a little bit behind, which is bothering me. The sun is in a horrible spot right now. For the history of the English Bible, there is nobody more important than William Tyndale. 1526, Tyndale translates the Bible into English from Erasmus's Greek New Testament, but he also looked at the last Erasmus's Latin, which was right next to it, you know, just to help him out. Luther's German, he knew German, so he said, well, let me see what Luther did, just in case that helps. Uh, and also Jerome's Vulgate. So he's got four things in front of him, and he translates the Bible into English. And this is English that if the type font was a little bit better, you could read. Anybody know what, what we're looking at here? You got F's instead of S's, that's a big pain. The, the Gospel, the, the Gospel of Santa John, St. John, the first chapter. In the beginning, with uh, too many Y's, <laughs> was that word, and that word was with God, and God was that word. Sound familiar? Hey, it's English we can see and understand. Hallelujah, finally, right? The same was in the beginning with God. English, yay! <laughs> All right, and understandable. Tyndale does this work. We know he did the New Testament. We're not sure. He wasn't able to finish the Old Testament. He had some help with the Old Testament because his Hebrew was not good. We're not exactly sure what manuscripts he was looking at for the Old Testament. Uh, his New Testament is going to be the most influential, though. He ends up being martyred in 1536, and I'll tell the story in a minute. He couldn't publish it in England. Remember? The edict, the Constitution said, you can't translate the Bible without permission in England. He didn't have permission, so he left England. He went to, uh, to the continent, to a couple of different spots. He ended up publishing it in a city uh, called Worms. It will be a huge influence on every subsequent English translation until the modern Bibles, and even the modern ones now. Uh, it will be the basis of the Great Bible, which we'll talk about in a minute. One-third of the King James Bible is word-for-word word Tyndale. If you had Tyndale in front of you in a King James Bible, one-third of it is word-for-word. Word. One Tyndale scholar said that 92% of the King James Bible is Tyndale. So there he's not counting word-for-word word because of you know, word order changing and whatnot, but he's basically saying 92% of the time they didn't change anything that Tyndale did. So Tyndale is huge. Every Bible after this is going to be influenced by his work. Here's Ephesians up there at the top. Things that Tyndale said that you'll recognize. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I am the good shepherd. Blessed are the peacemakers. Many of those memorable phrases that you say, oh, I love that King James, how it says that. It's actually just Tyndale. Tyndale came out with it uh, almost 100 years earlier. Everybody is going to go with Tyndale. Unfortunately for Tyndale, when he smuggled Bibles into England, they were confiscated and burned in public because they were illegal. People were hiding them in, you know, bales of cotton and whatnot and sneaking them into the country, literally, into England, because it was illegal. And you think that uh, burning books in public is something Nazis did, but they did it in England because Tyndale's work was not authorized. So he was condemned as a heretic while he was in exile in Antwerp. He was kidnapped by agents of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. He was betrayed by someone that he thought was a friend. A guy that befriended him, that worked with him, betrayed him to Charles V. He was actually a spy for Charles. Uh, pretty nasty business. He was strangled and then burned at the stake in 1536. 
So they didn't like heretics. And the reason they thought he was a heretic was because he did an unauthorized Bible. Now, there's a couple other things that, that he did uh, that I'm going to get to in a second uh, that made them upset with him. Charles V was the Habsburg King of Spain, also the Holy Roman Emperor. He was the nephew of the recently divorced Catherine of Aragon. If you know who Catherine of Aragon was, she was Henry V or Henry VIII's wife. She didn't have any sons, so he said, I don't want you as my wife anymore, I want a new wife, because I want a son. And he said, hey, Pope, I want a divorce. And the Pope was related to Charles V. And he's like, um, no, because Charles V said, no, you can't give him a divorce, that's my, that's my aunt. You can't insult her like that. And so, of course, Henry VIII said, well, then I will form my own church, and I will be in charge of it, and I will give myself the right to have a divorce. And so you have the Church of England, all right? The beginning of the Church of England, not exactly the most uh, pure and momentous uh, motives. Uh, Henry VIII uh, had many wives, and none of them gave him a son. you got to think about whose problem it probably was. Uh, so Thomas Cromwell, the English chan chancellor, he is an ancestor of Oliver Cromwell from the, the uh, Civil War era. Uh, of England, English Civil War. You might have heard of Oliver Cromwell and the, old, and the Ironsides. He was the English Chancellor. And he and Henry VIII both tried to get Tyndale released. They didn't want him executed. But they were appealing to Charles V. And Charles was like, I'm really not in a mood to give you a favor, Henry, after you tossed my aunt out on the street. So Henry VIII's uh, issues ended up contributing to Tyndale being killed. That's in 1536. The next, uh, oh, I got two more things, but his dying words are, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. It was recorded at the time. Sometimes you've got these, you know, legendary things people said, you know, you think that's not really what he said. People recorded that, that that's what Tyndale said as they were, you know, getting him. Open the eyes of the King of England in 1536. His prayer is going to be answered practically <coughs> back in time, you'll see in a minute. So what did Tyndale do that ticked people off? He showed his, the fact that he sided with Luther in this Reformation business. Now when he was translating this, the Church of England was the Catholic Church, right? What's going on at the same time is that Henry's getting ready, ready, to, leave, ready to leave Rome, uh, but at the time they're loyal to Rome. And so he takes the word church and translate it, right, translates it as congregation. Congregation uh, means that the, the church is run by the people and not by the hierarchy. It's, nobody likes that unless you're a congregational church. Uh, and most churches are not. He took the word priest and translated it as senior or elder. He took the word penance and changed it to repent. And he took the word charity and translated it as love. So even, even those choice of his words showed that Tyndale was someone that believed in what Luther had to say. And so it marked him as a rebel at this time. Tyndale did something else with his translation theory, which is what we do today, which is very important. He didn't say, every time I come to a Greek word or a Hebrew word, I have to use the same English word. So here's my Greek word. That's the word. Let me find every time it's in the New Testament and translate it as the exact same word. All right? He said, don't do that. All right? That's called formal correspondence. That is a very literal translation. But it doesn't take into effect how the word is being used by that particular author. Instead, he said, you know what, I'm going to look at the context, I'm going to read the whole thing and decide what English word I should use in this instance. All right, if you look up in your Strong's Concordance or online, and you pick a uh, Greek word to see how it's translated in the New Testament, you'll realize oftentimes that there's one that is mainly translated, and then there's one that's uh, a few times, one that's a few times, and a, a different English word once, and a different English word once. That's what Tyndale did. He said, I'm not going to be uh, sort of straight-jacketed 
into saying that there is only one English word for every, every Greek word. Language doesn't work like that. No language does. All right? I'll demonstrate it by talking about the word love. In the New Testament, there are three words, and most of you will have heard this at some point, for love in the Greek New Testament. How many English words do we have for that? One. Because our English word for love is very wide. Our English word for love includes lots of things like, like. Oh, I love ice cream. And I mean I like ice cream, but I'm saying the word love. It's used for lust, right? Making love to someone, it's used that way. It's used for love between your family and between father and child and mother and child, that kind of love. And the love between a husband and a wife. It's used for lots of different kinds of love. Well, Greek had more than one word for that. So how do we translate that? Do we use the same word every time? Or do we come up with a different word? Or do we put something in front of it? We say brotherly love. Do we say loving kindness? You know, what do we do? So words are like that. And Tyndale realized that. He was actually very smart about his translation, which is why it has lasted so long, and while it, st it still sounds good. So there's Tyndale. And this is Tyndale's Ephesians. Uh, let me find the spot, because we don't have chapter and verse yet, so uh, it, it makes it harder. It's right here. Uh, I'm looking for Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Um, ah, here it is, right here. Follow with me right there. For by grace are ye saved, with an F instead of an S, ah, saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should have, should boast himself. It's a little awkward, but it's exactly the way we have it today. For we are his workmanship, workmanship created, in, created in Christ unto good works. I mean, it's, if you know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. King James didn't change that at all. Uh, except for to change, get rid of that whole FS thing that, uh, that they used to do that's kind of annoying. Uh, but you can look at that and you can read that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with reading Tyndale. It's, it's not hard. So if you ever want to read what Tyndale wrote, you know, go online to uh, Bible Gateway or some other online site, pull, pull up a Tyndale Bible and just read it. Fit, what, 1535, what? Didn't I just say Tyndale was killed in 1536? And he said, open the eyes of the king of England? In 1535, Miles Coverdale published an English language Bible legally. So even while, uh, while Tyndale was being captured and put on trial and all of that, the king of England was already changing his mind about the legality of an English translation. Just not Tyndale's. All right. It was legally published by approval of Henry VIII. Anne Boleyn was his sponsor. So whilst Anne Boleyn was the wife of Henry VIII, uh, Miles Coverdale had the ear of the king. Of course, Anne Boleyn did not stay the wife of Henry VIII very long, because nobody did. She ended up losing her head in 1536. Uh, so Miles Coverdale's work... Uh, survived and became known as the Coverdale Bible. Now, he utilized Tyndale for most of his New, Trend, New Testament translation. So he didn't come up with a new translation, he just used Tyndale. Changed a few things here and there. Before Tyndale was even executed, his bi the, basically his Bible was being legally published in England under somebody else's name, <laughs> because that's just kind of the way politics works sometimes. It got Tyndale killed, and Miles Coverdale did it legally. He did his own Old Testament uh, translation. Uh, he ended up being exiled under Queen Mary. So politics in England at this time were pretty, uh, pretty rough. You could be the king's favorite one year, and the next king could uh, put your head on the block. So you gotta, got to be careful. So there's Miles Coverdale. We're going to have a whole series of Bibles that come out between 1535 and 1611. 
a whole series of them, and every single one of them is going to be mostly Tyndale. Matthew, the Matthews Bible in 1537, a year later, uh, edited by John Rogers, who used a synonym, a, a pseudonym. John Rogers said, you know, maybe we'll go with a fake name for the publication of this, just in case it doesn't go well. And the men, uh, you know, could see that it was dangerous. So he put somebody else's name on that, but it's just an edited version of Tyndale. Uh, using Coverdale for a few sections, but mostly Tyndale. Once again, authorized by Henry VIII, uh, which, if you want to call Matthew's Bible or the Coverdale Bible the fulfillment of Tyndale's dying prayer, it doesn't really matter. It happened almost instantaneously. Uh, so basically, the Bible that was being burned one year was being legally published the next. When it had Tyndale's name on it, it was illegal. With Coverdale's or, or, Matthew, or John Rogers' name on it, it was legal. But it was the same Bible. All right, And they knew that. It's not as if the, the church authorities didn't realize they were using Tyndale. But Tyndale was condemned as a heretic. So you've got to stay away from having his name on stuff. It's one of those things. Now, something that he did... Uh, John Rogers, which is probably why he put somebody else's name on it, as he put notes in the margin. And the church was not a fan of some of his notes, because sometimes when you put notes in the margin, they are political in nature, and that can get you in trouble. He was arrested in 1553 for seditious preaching, which means he was preaching against whoever was sitting on the throne at the time, which happened to be Bloody Queen Mary. All right? Probably not the right person to do that. Uh, and in 1555, he was burned at the stake, the first martyr under, quote unquote, Bloody Queen Mary, uh, during the short Catholic Restoration under her reign. So it didn't end well for John Rogers. Even though he put somebody else's name on the Bible to avoid getting in trouble, uh, he got in trouble for his preaching. I'm not exactly sure what he said, but whatever it was, uh, they were not a fan. They burned him at the stake, which is not a good way to go. 1539. Oh, you know what? I totally have missed uh, a couple of these. There, this, just to show you, this is a Martin Luther Bible, uh, actual size. Uh, which is in German, so it's probably not going to help you too much. This is a Tyndale. This is a pocket-sized Tyndale. They made different ones, but they made this pocket size. Uh, some of the other things Tyndale said that you'll recognize. Uh, the salt of the earth, fight the good fight. All of those phrases, all those cool phrases uh, are all Tyndale. He had a really a good, uh, a good flair for writing. All right? If you're going to smuggle a Bible, this is the right size to smuggle, right? Not the 75-pound one that we saw earlier. You're going to have to smuggle something that you can actually hide somewhere in your robe or something, right? When somebody's looking for it. So anyway, the Great Bible, 1539, uh, sometimes called the Chained Bible. As you can see in this picture, there's a chain on it. The reason being is that they put them in the churches for public reading, and they didn't want them stolen. So they chained them, because they're still expensive, a big printed Bible like this. This is, once again, Miles Coverdale, once again heavily reliant upon Tyndale, also using Matthew's work, using Erasmus. So notice those ones are, are, are just, they're most famous for being huge and heavy and thick. Uh, that's, a, that's a manly sized Bible there. Um, one of the things that uh, is said to have happened when these Bibles were placed in the churches on the lecterns is that, and there aren't any uh, <coughs> contemporary writings of it that you could prove it one way or another, but there's a lot of people that say it happened, is that people showed up to listen to somebody read the Bible. They found a guy that could read and that could speak well, and they just sat there and listened to him read sections of the Bible. They'd never heard it before like that in English. Because the, the service was in Latin. Everything the priest said that was important was in Latin. The readings from the Bible were in Latin. 
And so the average person was sitting there in church most of the time going, I have no idea what they're saying, <laughs> right? I mean, you learn the, the, the words that people say all the time, but the rest of the time, they don't know what's being said. When, when these Bibles were placed in the churches, they just sat there and said, keep reading, keep reading. You know, I can imagine the one guy in town that actually knows how to read, right? He's like, can I have some water? You know, I, I, I've done ten <laughs> chapters, can I take a break, you know? But reading being fundamental, not that many people knew how back then. Because most jobs didn't require it, since 95% of people were involved in the production of food, uh, agriculture, fishing, all that kind of stuff, because that's what was necessary to have enough to live. All right, so there's the cover page of the Great Bible. I put that on there just because it's uh, cool looking. Notice uh, what Coverdale did. He put Henry VIII on the throne on his cover of his Bible. Smart with your politics, right? Henry VIII, not exactly a nice guy. So put him on the throne in the middle of it. Notice he is giving the Bible over here, uh, which is which, to lay people, the regular people, and over here to the aristocrats, to the priests. Isn't that nice? Henry VIII wants everybody to have the Bible. Gotta love him. Uh, it allowed churches to obey the decree in 1538 that every church should have a public Bible. And I already told you that part, that crowds gathered and they were chained uh, to the public so they didn't go anywhere. All right, uh, and this is going to be our last uh, stop for tonight. Uh, well, no, I've I got two short ones after this. Um, before, we'll start at the beginning of the King James Bible. That'll be where we pick up next week. I hope to get further, but that's life. This is the Geneva Bible, and this is going to be important more for its notes than for the text itself. Now, it was, it was published by Protestant exiles during the reign of Queen Mary. Plenty of influential and important Protestant people said, I can see what's going to happen if I stay in England. I'm getting out of here. They went to Geneva, where good old John Calvin was running things. Everybody who's in the reform movement knows John Calvin, very famous. They went there and they put together an English Bible. This is the first English Bible to contain da -da -da, verses. 9, 10, 11, 12, hey, finally you can find something, all right? Before this, there were none, all right? Somebody got the bright idea that maybe we should make it easier to find things in the Bible, and we'll put chapters and verse in there. And so this is the first one published with that. Notice before, right? No, no, verse, no, no, no verse numbers. I had to find Ephesians 8. Now you can find it. It is the first English Bible to use the Latin typeset. If you get in here and look at this, these letters look like modern letters on your computer, which makes it much easier to read. Right? Than those old fancy ones. Fancy letters are great and all, but if you want to read, the standardized ones are better. It was small, it was cheap, it was affordable. Perfect for the average everyday man. Only one problem that the government had with it. This is text. This is notes. Text, notes. A lot of notes. This is the first study Bible. But all of the notes are Reformed theology. Reformed theology doesn't always sit well with the King of England. Because Reformed th theology has something to say about the divine right of kings. Kings believed in this time period that God had chosen them to rule, and anybody that said otherwise better shut it or they're going to get it. If you put stuff in the margins in the notes that hint at the fact that you think that perhaps the people might have the right to rule and the king has to derive his you know, rights from the people and all that kind of Magna Carta kind of stuff, not everybody up in the government is going to be happy with that. So the Geneva Bible had a lot of notes. As you can see on this particular page, there's more notes than text. All right? Which is great and all, as long as the notes don't uh, tick people off. Uh, the Geneva Bible is a revision of Tyndale. All right? It had the assistance of John Calvin, John Knox, Theodore Beza. These are titans of the Reformed theology. 250 notes. Uh, serious big notes about stuff. This is the Bible of William Shakespeare. So often when Shakespeare is quoting the Bible, and he does all the time, he is quoting the, 
Geneva Bible. Sometimes he's quoting the Great Bible or Coverdale, but often he's quoting the Geneva Bible, which is sometimes it's not easy to tell which one because they're all using Tyndale. This is the Bible of the Puritans. When the Puritans went to America, they had a Geneva Bible in their pocket. This was the one that they liked. Next to Tyndale's version, this is the second most influential on the translation of the King James Bible. And it will not be surpassed in popularity in England until 1642. For 31 years after its publication, they sold more, they, had, they were selling more Geneva Bibles than King James Bibles. The people loved the Geneva Bible. Government, not so much. Too many notes. In fact, the Scottish Assembly, gotta love the Scots. In 1580, the government of Scotland required every home in Scotland to have a Bible, a Geneva Bible. And they authorized the police to search your home to make sure you had one. So now, any, everybody that complains, the government's against the church, the government's out to get us. In 1580, the government said, you got a Bible? You, you want to find? Because you better get a Bible. I mean, they were serious about that in Scotland. They're serious about a lot of things. So the Geneva Bible is a big step. Two quick ones before we close. I know my time is short. The Bishop's Bible. In response to what uh, the Geneva Bible did, the king said, all right, guys, we've got to come up with a new translation without the notes. They tried to compete with the Geneva Bible, not, didn't do so well, but they did something important, something uh, interesting. In the 1568 edition, in their first edition, 1 Corinthians 13 said, Love, the greatest of these is love. In 1572, they changed it to charity. The greatest of these is charity. And that's an argument about what that Greek word is best translated as love or as charity. All right? The King James Version, originally at least, goes with charity following the Bishop's Bible, their example, uh, in a very famous passage. Most people don't, try, don't quote it that way anymore, right? If you hear it read at a, at a wedding, they almost always say they use a translation that says love and not one that says charity. Um, Church people, the bishops and priests and whatnot, they liked the bishop's Bible. Common everyday people, they said, oh, we already got the Geneva Bible. What are you doing? We're happy. Leave it alone. And then the last one before we get to the King James next week is the Dewey Reams Bible. The Dewey Reams, if you look on our chart, is directly below Wycliffe and Gutenberg. Because the Dewey Reams is a translation of the Latin all right. It is from Jerome's Latin straight into English. So it has nothing to do with Erasmus and the Greek text. But the Catholics in England, there still were plenty, said, well, what Bible are we supposed to read? We want one in English, too. And so uh, the English Catholics said, you know what? We want Catholic margin notes to compete against the, the Geneva Bible's reformed margin notes. They said, if you can play the margin note game, we can do it, too. Of course, the King of England is not going to like their margin notes any more than Geneva's uh, because they, the Catholic margin notes aren't going to be favorable to the King of England either. Uh, so this is basically the ancestor of the modern American uh, Catholic English Bible, is Dewey Reams. It's called Dewey Reams because of the, the two places that they did the work uh, in France on this translation. Um, and so now you have the Catholic Protestant argument going on in the margins of different Bibles. The Geneva Bible has got its marginal notes. The Dewey Reams Bible has got its marginal notes. And if you read the marginal notes, you get the picture of where the translator is coming from. It's not that hard. Uh, and that is where I will leave off. Next week we will start talking about